Soho's clubland and the criminal underworld supplied much of the remaining Crown evidence against Hanratty. Charles France, Hanratty's best friend, said Hanratty told him that the back seat of a bus was a good hiding place. The murder weapon had been found on a 36A bus. Hanratty explained that he used the bus not for hiding guns, but for dumping unwanted stolen goods. An ex-employee at the Vienna, William Nudds, testified that on the morning before the murder, he told Hanratty where to catch a 36A bus. Nudds, alias Jack Glickberg, had a string of convictions and was a notorious police informer. He made three conflicting statements, admitting that one was lies from start to finish. Then, the Crown produced another criminal, Roy Langdale. He claimed that in the exercise yard of Brixton Prison, Hanratty had made a full confession to the crime. We took the view that the prosecution was scraping the barrel. We managed to find other prisoners who'd been on remand with Hanratty, whose evidence, as I remember it, was really quite convincing and sensibly given, uh, which made it plain that Langdale simply couldn't be relied on. At Langdale's own subsequent trial, a detective put in a good word for him. Normally, he is very helpful to police. Then came a fierce courtroom dispute over ACOT's records of the interrogations of Han Ratty. One in particular lasted an hour and three quarters. When delivered in court quite slowly, it took only 20 minutes. And, and so we naturally suggested, uh, on Han Ratty's instructions, uh, that uh, very much more had been said by him. Acott said that long pauses accounted for the discrepancy. Then there was a question the police did not immediately ask. Mr. Acott is having a conversation with him on the telephone. What do you think an experienced police officer wants to know about? Where were you on the night of the 22nd, 23rd of August last? Oh, said Mr. Acott, I did not ask him that. I suggest that he did. I suggest he must have done. I suggest it is almost incredible that Mr. Acott should not have done. In the car, the gunman used the phrase, I want a kip. Under interrogation, Hanratty allegedly used the same phrase that he wanted to kip, but according to Acott's records, as early as 9.30 a.m. Acott denied Hanratty's charges of fabrication. Today, evidence not disclosed by the police is emerging. Statements by the Vienna hotel manager, by the conductress of the 36A bus, and by Valerie Storey, never shown to the defence, never heard by the jury. Nor were the jury given a clear-cut motive for the crime. The prosecution could suggest only that Hanratty had chanced upon the car and turned into a rapist and killer. But if Hanratty had no motive, could anyone else? The trial made no mention of the three-year affair between Michael Gregston and Valerie Storey. It was no secret, except to the jury. One man in the public gallery became increasingly disturbed at the quality of evidence against Hanratty. I followed the trial at Bedford. I became convinced of his innocence. And for the last 30 years, I've been fighting to hear his name and get justice done. John Justice was particularly struck by the lack of forensic evidence. There was no scientific evidence. As Gerard said, we have the best forensic laboratory in the world. And what have they produced in this case? Nothing. There wasn't a fiber, there wasn't a fingerprint, there wasn't a hair, nothing to fit, connect Hanratty with that crime. And this man had been in the car for six hours, terrific tension, murder, rape, nothing left at all. Hanratty had trusted that there would be forensic evidence in the murder car to clear him. As a, a petty crook who'd been through the courts and been investigated very often, he would have known perfectly well that he wasn't obliged to give hair, 
blood, saliva samples, unless he wished to do so. He volunteered those samples to the police. We thought that spoke volumes in his favour. But Han Ratty relied upon an alibi that went disastrously wrong. He said he left his basement room in the Vienna Hotel on August the 22nd and then set off to sell some stolen jewellery, spending the night 200 miles away in Liverpool. But he couldn't say where or with whom he stayed. His defence team became increasingly worried. Sherrod said to him, I want you to go in the box, Jimmy. Well, he said, in that case, he said, it's, it's looking a bit serious, you know. He said, well, in that case, I'll tell you the truth. I'll give you the whole alibi. I went to Liverpool on the 22nd, and from there I went to Rill, to a landlady. He said, I don't know the name of the street, I don't know the name of the house, but I know I was definitely there to sell these um, jewellery and different stuff. Hanratty said that having casually lied at the outset, he became too scared to change his story. Now he claimed to be telling the truth, but the new real alibi was not promising. All Hanratty could initially recall was staying at a guest house with a green bath in the attic from where he could hear trains. So in mid-trial, investigators began hurriedly checking the guest houses of Rill, and in Kimmel Street, near the railway line, was Ingledean, run by Mrs Grace Jones and her daughter Brenda. The gentleman called and showed my mother and I a photograph, you see, and asked us if we recognised this person on the photograph. Uh, he seemed familiar to me, but my mother was, you know, confident that she knew him. She said, oh, he stayed at my guest house. She recognised him straight away. And then he asked my mother if she was willing to go to Bedford with him. Of course, uh, she was quite willing to go, but we didn't know what it was all about. The defence called her Mrs Miracle Jones, but she made a critical mistake. She spoke to another witness, then denied it in the witness box. Her credibility was damaged. Even worse, None of her other guests that week had seen Han Ratty. But how good was the real alibi? Han Ratty recalled going first to the fair, hoping to see a friend who always parked his black taxi out front. But that particular evening, the taxi wasn't there. It was back on the fair the next day, but it was definitely not there on the night of the murder. I believe that he did definitely come to that fair to look for me. And he could see with taxis not there, I wasn't there. So then he went looking for digs, didn't he? She took him in. Of course, all the rooms were booked at the time, but uh, we had this room at the very top of the house. Uh, it was a bathroom, really, but it was used for emergencies, and there was a bed in there. And, of course, he was desperate for a place to stay. So my mother mentioned it to him about this room, and of course, he took that room. Hanratty's description of Ingledean's interior matched up. The green bath is still in the attic today. But why did none of the other guests remember Hanratty? I mean, the people were there uh, in the trial that had stayed here the week that Han Ratty was here. They were at the trial, but they didn't recognise him because he wasn't in the dining room having breakfast. There wasn't any room in the dining room. And uh, he was the only man that had breakfast in our own living room. No one else had breakfast that season in our own living room. But Han Ratty's alibi did not ultimately depend upon Rill. It is often said that Hanratty changed his alibi from Liverpool to Rill. That, that's really not quite right. The substance of the Liverpool alibi was maintained. Even before Hanratty reached Rill on the crucial evening, a sweet shop assistant had placed him in Liverpool only about four hours before the crime began in Buckinghamshire. It was very important because there was the evidence of Mrs. Dean Woody, the lady in the sweet shop, who, if she was anything like right, had Hanratty in Liverpool. He couldn't have imagined 